farming on the family farm with his wife and three teenage children. They currently milk 270 cows, threshing them seasonally. In March and April, they utilize grass pastures at the peak of their forage growth. Let's give Tom a hand. Well, thank you. One sentence, he summarized it all. Is there any questions? Uh, uh, just a little little interesting story. I was at a Farm Bureau meeting the other day, and my son was sitting there with me and happened to be a politician sitting there, and he's like, he started talking to my son. He's like, so, son, you think your dad voted for me? He's like, well, I don't know. He's like, what do you know? And he's like, well, son says, I'm a da we're dairy farmers. He's like, our cows graze. Do you know anything about that? He's like, well, I think I do. He's like, well, what's their manure look like? Politician says, well, it's kind of runny, isn't it? Oh, well, yeah. He's like, but my daughter has horses, and they eat grass, too. Do you know what their manure looks like? He's like, well, yeah, I've seen it on the roads from the Amish community. It's like those road apples. Well, that's right. He's like, she's also got goats, though, and that looks, you know, he's like, what's that look like? And the politician says, well, son, it looks like little chocolate-covered raisins. He's like, well, very good. He's like, now, can you tell me if they all eat the same thing, why does it all look different? He's like, oh, gee. He starts thinking about it. Politician says, well, I, I really don't know. Kid says, well, why should dad vote for you? You don't know shit. <laughs> so anyway, uh, that's kind of how I roll. I take a sense of humor with everything. Uh, like I say, I'm from Michigan. We use our hand. I'm right in the middle, central Michigan, between Lansing and Grand Rapids. Uh, the slogan of our farm is, get high on milk, our cows are on grass. A uh, little bit of history, uh, my background, I have a four-year degree from Michigan State. I took that out and into the world, spent two years as a feed consultant, didn't enjoy that, living off a commission, so I went back to the family farm for two years. Me and my brother fought with my dad, so for the betterment of the family, moved off the family farm, spent a couple years in the dairy industry as a herdsman on some larger dairy farms. Ended up, ended up coming back to the farm after a couple of years when my dad got fatally ill with cancer. Uh, I am the only one out of the seven brothers and sisters that took over the family farm. So that's where I'm at today. Um, I have a wife, Diane. We've been married for almost 21 years. She couldn't be with me here today. She had to stay back at the farm and take care of things up there and along with an ailing father-in-law of mine. We've got a 20-year-old daughter, Cameron. She's uh, currently enrolled at Michigan State and tackling the world by leaps and bounds in the dairy judging community. And I've got a daughter, Miriam, who's 17, and she's currently at Washington, D.C., competing in her, and taking in the Ag 4-H Summit. And then I've got a 15-year-old son, Michael. Yes, he's 15. Legally, he can't drive, but on the farm, we do just about anything we can get away with. So they've become a very valuable asset to the farm in recent years. So as I said, I returned back to the family farm in spring of 99. We were milking about 120 cows. After about two years, I had expanded up to 170 cows with a 23,000 pound rolling herd average, which is by no means a slouch at that point, I'd like to think. But that winter, I incurred a Staph aureus mastitis outbreak that caused me to either lose or sell 40 cows in the herd. And I decided if I'm going to farm the next 30 years like this, I'm either going to go nuts, go crazy, or whatever. So with that, I adopted the managed intensive grazing principles that I had learned from my good friend Howard Straub down the road. And uh, I haven't looked back. We started uh, going seasonal, and we outwintered heifers as we grew the herd. And in 2008, we had an expansion to accommodate that growth, uh, in which here in the aerial view, you can see if I can get this pointer to work. And yeah, like I said, I can't see red. I'm colorblind. So at the top of the picture, there's a manure pit, holds about a million and a half gallons of manure throughout the course of the year for the dairy operation. That's a valuable tool. We just put the fertilizer out on the field when we need it. We don't have to worry about daily haul or anything like that. So, and along with that, between the blue silos and that manure pit is a white roof. That's a 90 cow freestall barn we added on to accommodate the heifers in the winter months so we wouldn't have to outwinter them anymore. And now, like any other farmer, we've gotten bigger, so that's full of milk cows most of the year too now. Uh, 
In the lower part, you can see there's a couple of bunkers across the road from the farm. One's full of corn silage, the other haylage. And in the far right, there's long rows of uh, wrapped baleage. We do a lot of that. And then also, I don't know, yeah, I can't tell where that dot's at. There's a driveway going across the road from the farm. That's the cow lane because half the cow, half the time, the cows are going across the road to get to their pasture. It's a small dirt road, county road. About once a year, a car goes through the wires when the cows are waiting to come across, but not a big deal. They're pretty well trained, as the last gentleman said. They kind of know where they need to go, even if the wire breaks. So, so here I am today. I've been grazing for 17 years. We've expanded over the years to 275 cows with 170 replacements, 600 acres total that we own and operate with the equivalent of a four full-time people, that being one other full-time guy, my family, and some high school help, and GM, General Motors retired help, C Central Michigan, we can say GM, everyone knows what it is, but anyway. Uh, the breakdown is 220 acres are devoted to pasture, 100 acres to alfalfa, 200 acres to corn, 60 acres in soybeans, which I store those on the farm. We roast them, grind them, and feed them back to the milk cows as need be for their primary protein source. So pretty much everything we grow, we try and utilize in the cow. The wheat we grow, because every dairy farmer grows wheat for straw, along with the soybeans, I now round bale that stubble up too for bedding for the winter months. So when it comes to that 220 acres of pasture, down on the uh, lower left, there's 70 acres that's devoted to the heifer pasture through the summer months. That's broke up into eight quadrants, and I rotate them around as need be. Uh, they'll go out there after first cutting. I'll take the spring flush off and harvest it as either silage or baleage. And after that, then I'll bring the heifers out there and start grazing it. And then on the uh, far right, there's 15 acres, those triangular pie-shaped piece. Uh, those are devoted to my calves because they got four high tensile wires around them. They're close to the farm. If the calves are not looking right, we'll know it. And the wires keep them from getting out. So the remaining pastures, there's about 30 paddocks. That's devoted to the milk cows. They're three to four acres in size, each one is. The cows will go out to one paddock during the day. I'll have a break wire in there and they'll get half of it. And then we'll bring them back in for the afternoon milking and we'll let them back out there at night. The break wire's gone, they get the whole three or four acre pad paddock. So with 30 paddocks, they're on a 30 day rotation. This past summer, it was so dry, they didn't even go out during the daytime in August till October because it was, in 17 years, it was the most challenging year of grazing I had endured. But every year is different and you seem to persevere, so. And as I said, with those pastures, they're all pretty well established at this point in my career, but if I need to renovate any of them, I'll put the milk cow or the dry cows out there this time of the year until May, just during the daytime hours and let them calve out there, spread some of their manure for me. Uh, so, and then once I'm done planting all my crops in the spring, I'll go back to these paddocks and I will rip them up and I'll either plant them to a sh short day corn silage or I'll plant them to sorghum sedan grass so that the cows can graze them in the hot, dry summer months of the year. We'll get about three grazing passes off of it before we need to plow it back down and reseed it back to permanent pasture in the fall, as you can see on the right side of the picture there. Before we get a frost in central Michigan, it'll be anywhere from an inch to three, four inches tall. And as long as you got good soil fertility, in my opinion, you can get away with that late of a grass establishment in the fall. I think the key to a lot of things you do on the farm comes down to soil health and how you manage that soil. So, and with the other pastures, I believe in good pasture management. You know, in April, all the grass looks nice, short, green and lush, and for high producing milk cows, that's important. But as the summer rolls on, depending on the weather and the conditions, it gets tall and it gets away from you. So once I get done with first cutting alfalfa on all my fields, I'll come back to my pastures and try and clip them. And uh, I'll clip them three to four inches high and go back out the next day, rake it and round bale it for baleage and, and wrap it. 
If there isn't that much there to clip and round bale, I'll actually clip it first and then go out there and graze it the next day. And that way they can disperse and eat some of that windrow on their own. Keeps me from choking out the established grass stand. Gets better regrowth. So, so that's in summary the pasture renovations of either seeding it to sorghum sedan grass or a short day corn silage and planting it back to a blend of grasses depending on the topography. If it's high and dry, it's orchard grass and tall fescue, 25 to 35 pounds. If it's low and wet, we'll put in perennial ryegrass because it'll handle the hot, dry days of summer. I put six pounds of alfalfa in there uh, for the long-term legume. That's a typo. I only put in two or three pounds of Alice White Clover and one pound of chicory. I love chicory. I get late maturing varieties from Berenberg. It doesn't bolt as easy. That leafy thing, it's got the energy of shell corn, but it's got the mineral package of a multi-mineral vitamin. I've been out there mowing hay on a hay field because I put it in my alfalfa, and I've seen deer pick their head up, and they literally got a chicory leaf hanging out of their mouth. So if the deer think it's good, it must be good. And I like to plant twice in a crisscross pattern with my John Deere no-till drill, because that's what I have, because I'm kind of a row cropper too. So try and get a thick establishment right off the get-go. So, and I'll also fertilize it in the spring with a soil amendment from uh, Midwestern Bioag of your NPK and your traces, along with some fertilization on my pastures in the fall of urea and ammonium sulfate, about 100 pounds the acre. So, when it comes to my 100 acres of alfalfa, First and fourth cutting come off as haylage and put chopped and put in the bunk. Second and third, I will put up as baleage, mow it one day, bale it the next. If I'm lucky, I can even do hay in a day and have even better quality feed. When it comes to seeding the alfalfa, I've come up with a plan that I like of spring, spring seeding alfalfa. And those are the rates that I plant it at. The grass blend is uh, something called Milk Wave from Berenberg. It's tall fescue and meadow fescue. And once again, I put that one pound of chicory into just about everything. So, and then a cover crop of triticale and cow peas. Uh, and this is what it looks like 45 to 60 days later. It just looks really nice, awesome quality, 18 to 22% crude protein. You can feed that to milk cows or heifers, whatever you want and it keeps out the weed competition too. So when it comes to the corn that we grow, a little less than half will be for high moisture corn, put it up in our blue silos. Uh, the greater majority will be in corn silage and that'll, whenever I can, double crop it. I'll put it in after a first cutting of alfalfa on an old hay field, plow it up, cover it with some of that manure, reseed it back to or seed it to corn, and I don't need any fertilizer between the alfalfa roots and the manure. It's got everything it needs to produce 25 to 30 ton corn silage, or even 200 plus bushel corn. Uh, same, and then I'll go after corn silage. I'll do fall seeded triticale and harvest that in the spring. Uh, triticale, as you probably all know, is a cross between wheat and rye. And if it's harvest right, like it here is here in this picture, it looks beautiful, it tests great, but every year is a challenge, every year is different. 2016, my daughter graduated high school. We had two weeks of iffy rain before the party. I respected my wife's wishes. I didn't do any silage. So by the time we got out there on Memorial Day, it was chest high, headed out. We had a bugger of a time getting it through the self-propelled custom chopper and it was basically tested like straw. But last year, I got it at ideal height, 22% protein. So on average, it was good stuff. Uh, when it comes to my livestock, uh, I've been using New Zealand genetics for the better part of 15 years up until recently. I really love them. They're black and white like a Holstein, but they're small like a Jersey, and they got the, the body condition of a beef animal. It's really worked great over the, over the career of grazing for me. Uh, we've also got a little bit of color in the herd because uh, it's just kind of boring to look out in the barnyard or out in the pasture and see all black and white. It's kind of nice to have a few things out there like a red and white skunk or something. So, And uh, over the years as I've been grazing, I've been called by my fellow grazers a hybrid grazer because I came from the confinement world. I still do a lot of TMR supplementation. 
uh, as I said earlier, I started at 120 cows. Back then, 70% of their diet would come from the pasture in the summer months. Now that I'm up to 270 cows with that same pasture layout, now 70% of their diet is from the TMR and only 30% from the pasture. But it still seems to work. We're maximizing what I feel is the cow's genetic potential. And here in the United States where com grain commodities are so cheap, it just makes sense to maximize that genetic potential at the cost of our concentrates. Uh, I also transitioned into se seasonal grazing as I did this. So we calve everything in March through May. That way the grass production follows the, the milk production demands and potential of the cow. And you're dried off in the winter months and if you need surplus feed, you can buy poor quality to keep a dry cow happy. So. When it comes to calves, that's my wife's job and my full-time guy, his wife's job to take care of calves. Women do a much better job with newborns than men do. So we put them into a group housing, feed them on a 10 nipple milk bar. As you can see in that picture, we put three hutches together, put nine calves in there and give them a 16 by 16 area. Keep them there for two months, start supplementing calf grain and dry hay. When that fills up, we put them into a transition barn that we modified to keep the newborns in for the first two months. It all seems to work good. We feed them raw milk twice a day, add a little bit of hot water to it so it's a little more palatable. Uh, seems to work. And we also dehorn and vaccinate them at that point in their life. And once they're two, week, two months old, we load them up in the cattle trailer, drive out in the middle of the pasture, and we unload five at a time while we're sitting on the perimeter on quads, making sure they don't get out. It took me a long time to figure this out. For like five or 10 years, I would let all 20 of them out. What a frickin' rodeo. I mean, they get taught electricity in the hutches with the training wire, but they still gotta learn their boundaries. Somebody's like, well, why don't you just let three or four out at a time? Oh, why didn't I think of that? So it's a lot easier now, but it took a while. So uh, when it comes to my mature heifers, uh, the breeding age ones, they'll go out to pasture in mid-April and they will stay out there till late November. Two years ago, they were out there till December 5th. This year, they were out there till November 25th and they get nothing other than free choice mineral. Uh, and I move that in a little wagon every day. Uh, in past, as it says there, I used to outwinter them when I didn't have housing. Uh, like I say, in the summer months, there's the uh, running gear that I modified to feed free choice mineral, along with some fly rubs to keep the flies off of them. Soak that with permethian and diesel fuel. I'm not organic, so I can do that. So, and then I just move it every day and check on them. And like I say, in the past, I used to outwinter my heifers. I've come to conferences like this, and they talk about how you can do it with sheep all winter long, or southern Indiana. But up in central Michigan, you put 85 heifers out on a 35 acre field of radishes and uh, Italian ryegrass and in about less than a month, it's all gone. You graze it in two, three acre strips and by the middle of December, there's either too much snow or it's all grazed. And then you gotta just feed free choice corn silage and round bales and self-feeding wagons is what I did. And boy, by spring, the soil structure was shot. It was like marbles plowing that stuff up in the spring, but I couldn't take them on and put them back out and take them off. I had nowhere to go with them. So it's what I did until I could afford to expand the facilities at the home farm. So uh, some of the resources I've used over the years is attending grazing conferences and events like this. You get to meet new people new, and going to pasture walks, or as I'm trying to call them, farm forage tours because when I said pasture walks to the secretary at the vet clinic, I think she thought I was going on a religious retreat. So, but that's where you can see uh, ideas put into place. And I'm also part of a grassroots group, we call it, where we compare our financials annually this time of the year through the Cornell program. And also we'll meet on other individual farms throughout the year to analyze their farm and quote unquote, put them in a hot seat and see what they could do better or why they're doing what they're doing but that's been a valuable resource for me on the economic side to see what I can do to make myself more profitable. So, because uh, 
And being seasonal has been great. It allows me downtime in this time of the year and in August to have fun with my family because as, as I said earlier, I took over the farm when my dad passed away. So I've lost a lot of people close to me and I've learned life's too short. So you take advantage of it when you can. So, and you're never too old to learn. That's why I'm here today. I've had days like this and it seems like my family's never around when I'm working, but when I do something stupid, they're right there to put it on Facebook. <laughs> so that got sent to all my brothers and sisters around the country in a matter of minutes. Thanks. So, any questions? Yes? No. I, I pursued it from 2007 to 2010, and in 2010, that spring, they didn't want anyone's milk. Could have been six months, could have been two years. At my size, I'm the brains and a lot of the brawn that does everything. And those three years was so stressful on me, I was glad to revert back to my conventional roots. It's still nice to plant the corn on day one and then just call the crop production service guys and they go out there and spray it with Roundup and then I come back and harvest it 120 days later. The, that cultivating it two, three times, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yep. I, I milk about 70 cows this time of the year given like 30, 40 pounds of milk. They're tail enders that didn't get bred or they're Red late, so I never completely shut down. I got to justify me and the full time guy's wages. So, back there? Yeah. Yes, I am. Thank you for asking. Yeah, I do supplement those young calves. Three to five pounds of textured calf grain throughout the year. Every morning we just go out there with a Kubota or the John Deere Gator with. 12 pails of grain and dump it into 15 gallon drums that have been cut in half like little choo-choo trains. We just move them every day so you never get a dead spot and just dump that in there. And when you have to move them to another paddock, you just drag those with you and they come a following. So that works good. So 